Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Great. Uh, now I feel like a tech CEO. I feel like I'm, you know, Stephen Jobs, and I'm going <laughs> to launch the iPad. No. Um, uh, it's a real pleasure to be uh, with you all here today. Uh, we have a long-standing relationship with Kea at George Brown. And it's wonderful to see our students here, to see the students from Kea, and the students from Berlin, and from Sweden, and from Milan and all the other schools. Uh, with Milan, we've had, I think, over seven years of collaboration. So it's, um, it's just wonderful to be together, to share our ideas, and to work together. Um, you're going to be working over the next few days on trying to transform uh, certain territories in the city of Copenhagen by creating connections. And so what I thought I would do for you today is uh, describe um, some of the lessons we've learned in the eight to ten years that we've been working to try to create connections and to cross boundaries um, in the work that we're doing at the Institute Without Boundaries at the School of Design at George Brown. So, <coughs> next slide. So, the Institute Without Boundaries is a special um, uh, program that we created at the school. It was founded by a graphic designer named Bruce Mao, who is fairly well known, uh, especially I think in Denmark as well. And uh, he worked with our school and we created a program that was interdisciplinary and uh, that's really focused on design thinking, systems thinking, interdisciplinary collaboration and design strategy. And uh, our vision really is uh, collaborative design practice for a better world. And our mission is really to foster that collaboration between the design world and other worlds uh, to solve some of the uh, problems that we face as we enter this next century. Um, I'm glad to see that today there's a diverse type of students that are going to be working on the charrette. There's graphic design students, architecture, engineering. Uh, there's really, uh, I think, some new media students. There's a real mix of professional capabilities. And we believe, increasingly, the world needs people to collaborate uh, across disciplines to solve problems, and we're all about that. So what do we do? We have a postgraduate education program. And then on top of that, we layer a research and development division, which does special projects, unique projects. And then on top of that, we actually have a commercialization division, so it actually acts a bit like a company and uh, involves our students, our faculty, and experts in the industry to solve problems for people. We tend to be given problems that are wicked problems to solve, problems that are not easy to pinpoint a solution to. And uh, because of that, we developed very early on a, a technique of working on those problems uh, that uh, was based on the tradition of the charrette. And um, the reason we use that is, is when you have diverse minds in the room together at one point, you actually have a kind of uh, synergy intellectually that you don't get when people are working remotely uh, and across distance and aren't focused. So, uh, and now I'll borrow uh, uh, something from Steve Jobs, who created one of these interdisciplinary teams when uh, he ever he wanted to create a new product at uh, Apple. Uh, you know, you basically got to get people to focus, to be together, and to think about the problem. And that's, that's what you're going to do over the next few days. So uh, we start from a set of values, actually a set of values that we developed at the ICSID Congress. ICSID is the International Council for the Society of Industrial Design. And I happened to be uh, <coughs> president of that organization at one point in time. And, um, the, and actually, they held a very big conference here in Copenhagen in 2003, I think it was, or 2003 or 2005. I'm not, I can't quite remember which one, but it would have been one of those dates. Uh, but in 1997, we held a conference where we invited some of the greatest minds in the world together uh, to talk about how do we create what we call the humane village, which is a society that would be compassionate and caring. And uh, four key values came up that are critical for our society and critical for design. 
And they were um, intelligence, ethical values, sustainability, and universality. And what do I mean by that? Uh, when I say intelligent design, I don't mean creationism. But I mean uh, a design that is actually uh, where things are aware and communication with each other. So using intelligence built into products and systems uh, so that, for instance, uh, the building is aware of the people inside of it and the people inside of it can communicate to, to the building. Um, and this is something that we're going to see more and more of. Uh, some people call it the Internet of Things. But this is a, a trend that's very important. Sustainability, I don't think I need to tell you a lot about that. I think Denmark is one of the places in the world that is most interested in this topic matter. Um, but the, um, in your brief, as I was reading it, I saw that the rivers f have flooded recently. And uh, the same thing is happening in Toronto. Uh, right now in Toronto, we're having temperatures of around 22, 23 degrees. Our leaves have not changed color. They usually would have changed color in the last week of September. The climate is definitely changing and uh, you're starting to experience it. And the uh, idea of sustainability is a really critical one as we move into a world where we have to bring equity of resources across the world. And that's where the idea of universality comes in, or inclusion. Is, uh, we can't afford to have a world any longer where some people um, uh, have access and others don't. And the whole concept of universal design is that concept of total inclusion and access of populations, of uh, different cultures and different genders. And it's, it's a way of seeing the world where everyone belongs and fits in. And ultimately, ethical, um, or as we call it sometimes, balance. Um, the, one of the key things moving forward, I think, is the idea of balance. It's the idea of uh, what's appropriate. I think if people just think of their own life and they think of the whole idea of work-life balance, uh, that's uh, an emerging uh, trend. You know, what is the ethics of what we do? And uh, for me, ethics is always tied in design to aesthetics. So what is the right aesthetic is usually based on what is the ethic. So these are the four kind of values that we work with and that we see governing our work. Next. And then these are some of the things that we try to teach. Um, we try to teach collaborative creative methodologies. And I think this week that's something that you guys are working on here. You're going to be learning how to create collaboratively. Um, again, this is a trend that is emerging. Uh, it's very... Uh, pertinent to your generation, uh, digital generation, where people uh, crowd create and co-create. So we're actually trying to teach what are these methodologies, and the charrette is one of these methodologies. We try to teach design and th systems thinking. And uh, design thinking and systems thinking is really uh, about looking at not the problem in isolation, but the problem in context and not creating a solution um, based on the analysis of a tiny part of a problem, but understanding the problem as it moves through the context, right? And then we also try to teach insight and foresight. And uh, foresight is anticipating trends, and insight is understanding what they mean uh, to people's lives and the impact they have on people's lives. We teach design strategy, which in essence is design bias, where design is going, how do you create a, a, a movement and a momentum it, through your design. We teach evolutionary design paradigms. This is one that I'm very fond of. I think in the future design is more um, going to be about creating systems that let other people create for themselves as opposed to creating a product that's finished that people <coughs> consume. Um, the reason I'm so fascinated in this is I have a very interesting experience in my life. Uh, my parents were from Italy, and they immigrated to Canada uh, in the 1950s, and I grew up in Canada. And, uh, and really, 
my parents lived in a very feudal kind of medieval world and by the time I was growing up I was living in an industrial world and by the time I was graduating from university I was living in a post-industrial world so I was able to see a transformation across uh, time and it really helps me understand uh, the the change in design paradigms and I really do believe that right now we're really moving towards a paradigm um, where designs are systems for co-creation with end users. The last thing we try to teach is the ecology of innovation. People always uh, are talking about different types of innovation, uh, social innovation, technical innovation, business innovation, but uh, one of the things we've learned in our experience is that really uh, all of these innovations are tied to each other and usually when an innovation takes hold or has success it's because all of these parts of innovation are working in synergy with each other, right? So you've created a technical innovation uh, which uh, gives you certain possibilities of making something feasible but actually what it makes feasible is a social innovation which is a new way of living and but what makes that propagate uh, is a business innovation right? so um, two of our, our faculty are here Lori and Connie who's sitting someplace in the audience at the back but they uh, uh, stayed at Airbnb which is a social technical and business innovation and that's why it was so successful because it was a combination of the ecology of innovation so in that sense we're at I think a distinct point uh, socially where we're moving from uh, uh, one paradigm that took many centuries to establish which was a paradigm based on ownership and property to a new paradigm that's based on sharing many people have described this new economy as the economy of sharing I think the Airbnb where Lori's staying and Connie's staying is an example of that new economy of sharing but we're in this transition and we're trying to uh, navigate it and actually design is one of the best tools to navigate change uh, both to precipitate change or to mitigate against the impacts of change uh, because for me design is fundamentally how we share right? really like the fact that I say this is a chair and Irsa says this is a chair and you say this is a chair means that we all see a chair and uh, so if you think of design and everything that's around you in your world it's actually reinforcing the reality that is around you uh, by creating a common language of what's shared in the world right so it's actually quite fundamental to existence uh, if you think of uh, tools that we use to understand existence, whether it's numeracy, numbers, literacy, words, design, I think, is the most fundamental because I would say it's sensoracy, which is the things that we believe and share in common and feel and use in our lives. So you're going to be shredding, and you're going to be shredding to come up with design solutions for problems in your city. And so let me just tell you a little bit about what a charrette is and how they work. Next slide. So historically, uh, charrettes were established through the Ecole des Beaux-Arts in France. Uh, they uh, were named charrettes because uh, there was a cart that the proctor of the school took down the aisle and you used to have to throw your drawings in by a certain time which meant that you had to work very hard and very focused in a short period of time to finish your project right so um, th that's the origin of the word charrette uh, which is really the word cart um, and uh, it's, uh, it's going to characterize what you're going to live and experience over the next few days because you're going to be working for a few days very very hard to be able to present something uh, this Friday to your colleagues but as you can see, charrettes are, are not only hard work, they're lots of fun. They're a place where energy and creativity overflows and where your voice uh, can be heard and your ideas can be shared. And uh, so they're intense, they're collaborative, and they're creative. And they connect things. 
just like you're going to be trying to connect things. You're being connected through this process with students from other countries, students from other types of knowledge. You're going to be connected to professionals. There are many people here who are going to come and advise you. And most importantly, I think you're going to be connected to stakeholders. And those stakeholders are the people that you're going to be serving, the people in the communities that your projects are situated in. And as usual, our charrettes are interdisciplinary, and they're co-creative, and they engage diverse communities. And I think I've been extremely impressed how Kea has taken up the charrettes and made them their own, and have stayed true to the ideals of the charrettes, because they've really done them in an interdisciplinary, co-creative, and community-engaged process. You're going to be investigating context. You're going to be looking at details of projects and you're going to be trying to understand stakeholder needs. And so I encourage you during this process, when you run into something you're not sure of, always go back <coughs> to the context. Phone or find the stakeholders. Go back and find them if you're stuck. Because they always have the answer. And uh, I'll tell you some stories a little bit later about how much they have the answer if you only are willing to listen. And you're going to conceptualize and brainstorm and explore solutions and try to bring solutions to reality. That's always the most fun. The most fun is when you actually try to think it through in such detail and try to make your things really real. And to do that, you're going to propose design concepts. Hopefully, you're going to prototype some of them. And then you're going to use those prototypes to help you d uh, refine your solutions that you've developed. And ideally, you'll evaluate their feasibility by checking the design and stakeholder criteria. There could be nothing more interesting for you guys than to invite the people at the end that you were going to serve and have them view what you've done and give you feedback. I'll never forget, I had the chance to translate for one of the world's most famous architects, Mario Boda, because I studied architecture when I was in school. And I had to translate for my teachers. And they asked him a question about what he thought of school. And he said, well, there's a huge problem with school because you design for five years and you never make something for someone and have them tell you back if it worked. Right? So he says the most important thing to change about schools would be to change that reality. In other words, to make something for someone, have them tell you how it works so that you really learn and change uh, from what you learn from them. And here's a chance for you to do that. And we want you to generate innovative, feasible, and holistic ideas quickly and effectively. <coughs> so this is going to make you better at what you do. It's going to make you faster and quicker and more agile. So we started doing these charrettes in um, 2007. They were inspired partially on ICSID, um, which has a program called InterDesigns, where they gather people from around the world to solve problems in different countries. So we thought we would do the same thing in Canada. And what we did is we took four different communities in Canada, Port Perry, Downsview, Mount Dennis, and the city of Toronto, and uh, we invited students from around the world, and we invited experts from around the world, and we came up with solutions for those, um, uh, for those four cities. Um, what we were able to do is to connect international expertise uh, to help the community solve the problem. And it was amazing. Whenever ICSA does this, it's amazing. And when we did it, we realized how amazing it could be. And I think you'll find that for yourself. You'll find that the perspective from someone from Italy or someone from Germany or someone from Canada adds immeasurably to the, um, uh, to the insight when you're trying to solve a problem, right? You'll also find that there's lots of challenges. Main challenge when you have people together who are from different disciplines is that what someone means, when someone says, I would like this to be good, they mean a different thing in each different discipline, right? 
So an engineer, when he thinks that something is good, means that it's worked out and all calculated. And uh, an architect may think that it is uh, functionally laid out with aesthetics. And a graphic designer will think that it's communicated better. So one of the things I urge you to do is to try to learn what your language means. Uh, and so you'll have this double barrier of the language of different professions and the language of people from different parts of the world and different cultures, right? So the key to that is to not become afraid and to listen and to be open to hearing what the other people say because they're seeing it from a different perspective. And when you're open to it, you actually will find yourself feeling uncomfortable but as you listen, you'll find yourself able to grow. So the, this opportunity can actually grow you in a, a dramatic way if you listen. And you'll have to listen to various levels uh, of, uh, of difference. Okay, next. Ah, this project was another challenge. Uh, we went uh, to the government of Costa Rica and they asked us to solve this problem that they were having because in a particular area of Costa Rica, there was a whole set of global tourism resorts that were coming. And with them were coming people from different parts of the world. And they were displacing, actually, local communities. And it had gotten so difficult that the local community had staged a barricade around the resort to stop them from using their water. So this really introduced us to the whole problem of the global versus the local, which is a tension that is playing out across the world uh, in our economic markets, in, um, in, uh, in the developing world, and in the advanced world. So what was really interesting and what we learned was that as we dealt with people and we listened to stakeholders, we learned that their lives weren't better before the global came. In fact, their lives were terrible. They had to go and leave their families to find work because there was not enough work. And then we also heard that their lives were not better since the global had arrived because actually they were not given the place to work and other people were coming in to take the jobs that they could have taken. In fact, it, it boiled even down to, uh, in this part of Costa Rica, there are the eggs that come with the turtles. The turtles come to lay their eggs. And they used to have to protect them. And they used to be paid for protecting them until the agency in New York started getting all the money to protect the turtles because it was a global NGO. Of course, they weren't protecting the turtles, and they weren't paying the locals anymore to protect the turtles. So you started to see what the problem of the global and local economy were. And what we started to realize is that the solutions ha had to be responded to by uh, an idea we called globalism, which is the balance between the global and the local and the agreement. And one of the things that we were able to do with the charrette, which was amazing, was we were able to connect for the first time the people who ran the hotels and put them in a room with the local communities. And despite the fact that they had been there for 10 years, that had never happened, right? So the idea of bringing people together and having them in the same room was transformative. And it actually started to transform that community. So it was very interesting. And we came up with solutions. Um, solutions like a new social housing unit that was sustainable. Solutions like how to transform their public spaces. Um, their spaces were every city in Costa Rica has a square like this, but there's none of this going on. It's dry and green. And it's because half the year it's raining and half the year it is wet. And so they don't preserve the water for the other half of the year. So what we were able to do with the systems approach is actually introduce a cistern that would allow the square to develop this way. Right? And then, of course, uh, we created something called a dashboard, which was an app for how to design with people who are in different parts of the world. And um, how, do, how do you connect? One of the things we, we talked about connecting across cultures and across professions, but one of the biggest divides currently is the divide across age. 
right? Uh, older people are hardly ever with younger people anymore. Uh, in fact, people are almost isolated into age <coughs> clusters, right? So one of uh, the ideas behind this charrette was to connect different generations to each other and to nature. So this was a, a place in Toronto that is interested in the environment. And the whole idea was to develop a project where older people could share their knowledge about cultivating agriculture with younger people so that you'd have knowledge transfer uh, and intergenerational connection. And uh, this project, which we did in 2009, was really about renovating the suburbs. And the suburbs are, are in tremendous need of renovation. In fact, one of the things that you will see uh, right now, I notice that your main square is totally under construction. And probably the design of it was probably done about 70 to 80 years ago, probably around the time, maybe a little bit longer than that, around the time that the city hall was built. But most things in cities need to be renovated on a 60 to 70 year cycle. And um, our suburbs throughout our cities are built mainly in the 1950s and 60s. So this project was really about how do you renovate a place that was perfect when you had lots of gas and lots of energy in a time period where you no longer have lots of gas and lots of energy. So it's really about transforming and making the suburbs sustainable. And so thinking of what kind of connections. And so in this project, what uh, the students did was they tried to connect things through the school, the mall, and um, the park. Things that were typical in the suburbs, but reimagining them so that they would become more sustainable spaces. Um, in this, this was another project that we did in Toronto, as in Copenhagen, there are probably many social housing complexes. In Toronto, we have more than 200. And the complexes are owned by the city. And uh, in this case, we had a city with uh, 75 acres of land that ne will need to be redeveloped in 10 years. So the city came to us for a charrette that would plan for them the change of that piece of land for when it would need to be renewed. And what was interesting about this is, is that in responding, because we had interdisciplinary team and people from a different connections, we didn't just come up with an architectural plan. We came up with a social plan. We came up with a labor plan. We came up with a development proposal that understood the financials. And we came up with a food production and energy plan as well. So the critical thing was to rethink the infrastructure of the city, thinking about all the different layers and levels, rather than thinking about just one layer and level. And I, I, I've read your brief, and it is about infrastructure renewal. You have a subway that is going all the way through Copenhagen, creating a new ring. And that subway is going to have an impact. So think of the different layers that you'll be working with and how you layer in aspects, um, you know, the digital aspects, the physical aspects, the social aspects. Think through them all. Think through the question, the main question of how would you like to live now and in the future. And uh, this project was called Universally Local and uh, it was the, the same project that I just described. Next slide. Uh, we also worked with uh, cities in uh, South America. And this is a city in Chile called Lota, which is a city of 50,000 people. Uh, I think uh, some of the people in this room worked on this charrette and uh, recognize it. Um, it's a city that had lost its economic um, <coughs> development because the coal mine had closed and it was mainly a coal mining city. And then on top of it, the tsunami hit and it lost 10,000 houses. So it was a place of tremendous loss. And in dealing with that, um, we had to get to the fundamental root of the problem. And as our students 
charretted on this. In this case, they were looking for tourism solutions for the city. What they really realized was uh, that something at the core needed to change. And I think this is very fundamental as you're doing your project, is to try to understand the positioning. Because these people always were under the position that someone brought the economy to them and they worked for someone. And the real design exercise was to actually have them stop thinking that they should wait for the economy to come to them, but instead should make their own economy. So, you know, all of these different designs for a, a new hotel and for a new train station, etc., were all based on this fundamental understanding that they would have to make it themselves. And so, in this sense, when you're looking at your problem, in the city, uh, think deeper than just the, you know the physical elements that you're trying to understand. You're from your brief. I understand that you're working with areas that are diverse, right? And you're trying to integrate them into the city. So in essence, you're going to have to start to uh, ask yourself questions about you know. What is Copenhagen going to be like if it's going to be a diverse and happy place? What things need to change? Sometimes those things are really hard to change. Um, I can tell you, I fly back to Italy and I, I, I come from Canada. Um, one of the things I've noticed in Italy is just the words you use. For instance, in Italy, immigrants are called extra comunitari, which means those from without the community. In Canada, immigrants are not called those from without. They're called immigrants, people who have come to the community. So that distinction starts to tell a lot about everything. So you need to start thinking about like, what should our, our, our values be how do we want to live into those values? And how do we want to change the city? So how are we going to integrate? How are we going to deal with diversity? I think this is, from what I've seen, the biggest challenge for Europe. Because Europe comes from a place of strong cultures, where people are very proud of their cultures. And it's a real challenge to have to integrate people who are from other cultures. Um, from North America, we have the opposite. We're from weak culture. You know, we have people from all over. Toronto has people from 180 different countries. And so people are kind of used to living with diversity. So how, how can the designs that you create make a difference and maybe help change that reality? Thanks. And so here are some more pictures of the Lotta. We always do exhibits of the work that we do. So this is uh, the picture of the exhibition that we did at the end of the year. Next. Um, interestingly enough, there's a big change, just as Europe is experiences, experiencing this big change around diversity, North America is experiencing a change that it could never have predicted. And that is that people no longer are in love with the suburbs. This is a hard thing in North America because all of North America has been organized around the Anglo-American tradition of the suburbs, right? And recently, this town, which is just outside of Toronto, and one, it's the high-tech capital, came to us for solutions to become a city. Because it's actually very, very um, threatened by people's desire, especially young people's desire, to no longer live in the suburbs. People don't want cars, they want car share. People don't want single family home, they don't want to cut the grass, they don't want everything that their parents used to want. So uh, strangely enough, we had to think for a year uh, on how to change this, how to make suburbs, or what are called edge cities, complete cities. And that's uh, what we did in one of our charrettes. 
And we did that by connecting government, citizens groups, and, um, and, and companies. Because those were the groups that were at risk of losing a whole generation of youth out of their city. Uh, and in Dublin, um, last year we worked for a whole year with the city of Dublin and we were trying to help them reimagine their public services. And of course we used charrettes and we did three or four charrettes all during the year to solve these particular problems. And one of the things that we realized is that no matter what we did, because we were tasked with how could you save money and create better services, and no matter what we did using the old model, uh, the only answer that we could come up with was austerity and um, actually uh, you know, using less people to do more work, which actually didn't make for better services, right? So the students started really thinking hard about what could be a different and new model. And what they tried to do was to change the connection between the city and the citizen. Because the current model is that the citizen is a consumer and the city is a provider. Right? And so what we try to imagine is a model where citizens and city weren't in that relationship. We're in a different kind of relationship. And we came up with a platform called R Dublin, which would allow citizens to actually give information to the city and to work on projects for the city to change their city, right? Which is a very different way of working than the way they're working now. Because the way they work now is they wait for the service to come to them, and the service has to be better. In this sense, the citizen makes the service with the rest of the citizens in their community and are co-invested with the city in the service. So it's a different paradigm. And uh, we were able to do that by a participative model for public service, right? And so that's that kind of transformation and connection that we were trying to make uh, with this particular project. We're now trying to experiment with this with the city of San Francisco, actually. And we've been shortlisted to do an experiment with San Francisco using this model. And this year, um, after the charrette and Kea, I'm heading to New York because we're working with three cities this year, uh, New York, Chicago, and Toronto, to understand what we call global cities. Uh, global cities are cities that are gateways to their regions. And in the next five years at the Institute, we're going to be studying regions and how they work together. And so what we're going to be doing is holding charrettes in three different cities with the same groups in each city and trying to understand and learn by tackling the problem, the same problem, or slightly different problem in each of the cities. <laughs> and now just some, uh, th these are just some stories to show you how change can be made. This was actually a charrette that we did for our, these are our charrettes that we do for our private clients. So this was our Millennium Foundation, which gave scholarships to high school students to go to university. And of course, when the conservative government came in, they killed the scholarships. So all the cities across Canada had to come together and figure out a way to keep the scholarships going and, and solving the problems in their community. And so uh, I love to show this one because this was a, a, a region around Niagara Falls. Everyone probably has heard of Niagara Falls. But there it takes students sometimes three and a half hours to go by bus to their college because there's no buses that connect people to the colleges. And unless you have a car, you can't get there. So what they did is they actually brainstormed, because they didn't want to do anything about it, because it was going to be too much work. So they brainstormed what would be the least amount of work that would change their region. So they decided if they brought the mayors on a bus ride with the students, that that would maybe make the mayors understand that something had to be done. So this is them enacting what they're going to do and making the script to take the mayors on the bus ride. And they actually did it. <coughs> and now there are new bus routes in, uh, in Niagara region. Okay. Uh, this was a really interesting charrette where the city is pitted against 
its residents in their social housing. In Canada, there are um, trailer parks, and I don't know if people in Europe know them, but they're like little uh, metal trailers that are on a parks, and we're quite famous. There's even a TV show called Trailer Park Boys <laughs> for uh, these trailer parks. So these are the residents who live in the trailer parks, and they're very, very poor, and they live in these trailer parks, but they are sitting on lots of land, and the city wants to take that land and build social housing. So this, you're, you're stuck in the middle to try to help figure out how a city doesn't hurt its own residents. So these are the wicked problems. So you have to come up with connections that you never might imagine or th think of before. And so the way to do that is always by listening to the people. So if you actually go into these situations <coughs> and you just listen, you'll hear the answers coming from the people. So I urge you to listen to the people that you're with when you're out there. Thanks. And <coughs> these are their little houses. And actually, part of our answer was to go to the developers because everyone was afraid that the city wanted to sell the land to the developers. So our trick was to talk, get the developers to talk to the city because the city did want to sell the land to the developers. And the developers told the city, you'd be crazy if you sold the land. <laughs> and so it killed the idea of selling the land, which allowed a master planning process. Uh, this is a summer school that we did in Belgium. And it was with uh, Liège, Genk, Hasselt, and Maastricht. And it was a, an amazing experience because, again, we had people all across the world coming together to solve problems that were seemingly unsolvable. And in this case, the, my favorite problem in this one was there was a town that was built on a coal mine, and then they took away all the coal, and so the town started sinking. And the town sank 40 feet. So the river was 40 feet higher than the town. And they just kept building a wall. Uh, and then every time it rained, they had to pump the water up into the river. And so they were pumping thousands of gallons of fresh water. And so they came to us with this problem. And what was interesting is because we had engineers in other parts of the world where fresh water is a real problem, especially for high-tech industries, they had no idea that they could attract high-tech industry to use that water and be paid for the use of the water. And so, um, uh, so now the future of this town is going to be around finding these industries that need the fresh water to do their work. Uh, this was my favorite charrette that we've ever done, and I can't wait to do it again. In Toronto, we are having a terrible, terrible experience in transportation. For instance, from my house to my work in rush hour used to take me 30 minutes. Without rush hour is 15 minutes. Now, in just one year, it takes me 45 minutes. And then in the second year, it's now taking me close to an hour. So the traffic in Toronto is going crazy because we're multi-nodal and everyone is still in cars and it's just crazy. So what we did is we convened a consortium and it had, uh, we had 300 people come together to do a charrette. But what was interesting is it wasn't just students. It was professionals, it was the communities and experts from uh, engineering and from uh, organizations. And we did 10 different projects for our region to create sustainable transportation across the region. And it was amazing. It was people, first they charretted, and then we did something that we called atelier. And the people continued working together over a year to come up with these amazing sh solutions. So one group came up with the next generation car, which is an automated car that takes people and things. Another group invented a highway that collects more energy than it uses. Another group. Uh, invented something called Huberbia, which is the city in the suburbs. So you, you'd have a mobility hub and a city around a mobility hub. Amazing solutions came out of it, and it was amazingly fun. 
And then we exhibited them all. And uh, interestingly enough, transportation is now the top priority uh, at the governmental level because this really pushed the agenda. And so many of the biggest civic organizations like the Board of Trade and everything are now focused on trying to improve the transportation problem. <coughs> so this was one of the ideas, taking away the main highway and actually turning it into public transit where the main highway, which is in the valley, it's the, so that you could then have a restored natural valley. This was the people and things car which actually you can program it, it arrives at your house, it can take your, it can drop off deliveries, but then you can actually use it to uh, go where you need to go. Um, this project was uh, around uh, older people. Uh, I think in Denmark you already have a high older population, but in Canada we're <coughs> going to go from 5% to 40% in the next 20 years. So it's a new thing for us. This was actually taking and making an eBay of everything that everyone grows in their garden so that people could actually uh, sell to each other their extra produce from their garden. This was the Haberbia. So this is just a sample of where we've been working around the world and uh, I just uh, want to encourage you in your life, in your career, uh, to keep working with others you keep working with people who are different. Every time you meet someone different, think of it as an opportunity to learn something and extend yourself. It's frustrating. A lot of times it's really challenging. Even when you meet someone a lot like you, it's the most challenging because you see yourself for the first time, but you don't want to see yourself. Uh, so take advantage. Uh, enjoy these next three days and uh, and uh, next slide, only connect, live in fragments no longer. Uh, great writer, E.M. Forster, maybe more famous for the book, A Passage to India, but one of his other books, Howard's End, connect. Okay, thanks.